The race is on, and Max Verstappen won the French Grand Prix at Paul Ricard with a penultimate lap pass for the lead on Lewis Hamilton. But with strategy split, was this a race Red Bull won, or one that Mercedes threw away? I'm Ed Straw, and joining me to answer that question and many more are Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes. So Mark, when you're in France, who'd have thought it? F1 goes to Paul Ricard, and if it's close up front, we do actually get quite an interesting race. Yeah, it's it's uh, the previous two weren't exactly thrillers, were they? But uh, this was one of the, the the best Grand Prix of recent times, and you couldn't call it from lap lap one to the penultimate lap. It really was between those two, and you couldn't have said it, you, at any point, yeah, it's, this is definitely his or definitely his. Yeah, it was it was terrific. Yeah, and Scott Mitchell watching from Sweden, but it's just great this season still rolling on, isn't it? Another race where. It could have gone either way and it went down to the wire. Yeah, well, what I liked about this race is that um, it showed that you can have an entertaining and a good Grand Prix without there being um, sort of that wheel-to-wheel racing element early on or swapping places and and, and that sort of thing. It was a a race that was uh, intriguing. It was was tense right up until the penultimate lap. Um, And it was was just a... It just showed that the championship fight and the battle between Hamilton and Mercedes and Hamilton and Verstappen and Red Bull and Mercedes that we're seeing this season has is very multidimensional. It's not just a case of Hamilton and Verstappen taking lumps out of each other into turn one at the start or, or anything like this. There's there's lots of layers to this fight and it, the, the the way that it's interesting can manifest itself in all sorts of in all sorts of ways. Yeah, you're bang on there. A season of variety which is always great well, let's go on with it because there's huge amounts to talk about Scott before we get into the the detail of how the bulk of the race played out let's have a look at the start Verstappen got away ahead but then he had his moment in turn one that cost him the lead to Hamilton what did you make of that um I think it was just a, a simple and understandable error from Verstappen who um basically tipped the car into turn one expecting everything to be fine and it was for about a second and then mid corner the, the the rear stepped out and he had um i think he said like it wasn't one moment he had two, sort of two or three moments trying to gather it back up which is why he couldn't shoot off to the right and dive behind the bollard that you're meant to go around if you go off at that corner um you know he, he he lost he lost the lead as a result he didn't rejoin unsafely so that was all fine um it was part of a sort of first lap or two where quite a few drivers were complaining about the conditions and not feeling like there was necessarily as much grip as they thought. And Max just basically got, got slightly caught out. I mean, ultimately he, he did a very good job later in the race and obviously we'll we'll come to that. But um, yeah, it was one of those moments where based on the way the French Grand Prix has gone the last couple of times, that could have been the race defining moment and it would have been a race defining error from from Max as it is it's a it's an error that gets added to his tally but it isn't one that decided the outcome of the Grand Prix yeah it's funny that when things are really close we do get more of these small little errors inevitable really but as you said in the final reckoning it didn't matter in terms of the result but that said it did influence what happened so Mark we had Hamilton leading from Verstappen and Valtteri Bottas so can you pick up from there in terms of what led to the strategy playing out the way it did with Hamilton losing the lead in the first round of pit stops Yeah, well, once Hamilton just assumed that lead that Max had given him, it was reasonably comfortable. Max was right there with him. Um, But as the stint went on and Lewis was able to run in clean air, the the graining fronts, which were the the problem for everyone um, because of the, well, just the nature of the circuit anyway, but also because there'd been a bit of a a rain, quite a hard rain shower um, before the F3 race. So the, the track was pretty green, um, and I think that just added to the the, the stress on the on, on the front tires. So uh, front graining was the struggle for everyone, and Lewis running out front was was able to sort of you know keep keep his in probably better shape towards the end of that first stint. And he had oh, just over three seconds out on on Max at that point, um, with Valtteri a couple of seconds back from there, and Sergio. Perez running very conservatively, probably about eight, eight or seven or eight seconds back from Valtteri, um, but well clear of everybody else. Uh, but then a, a couple of things happened. Um, 
Mercedes used used Bottas to put undercut uh, pressure on Verstappen, um, obliging Red Bull to respond. You would have expected Mercedes to have brought Hamilton in on that same lap um, because there was there was nothing to really be lost by doing that. But they they kept him out for another lap after that because they were confident that the three point two seconds margin that he had um, it, it made him undercut proof, if you like. And so they just risked another lap. It just kept them in the safety car window, I suppose, for one more lap. It, it reduced what was going to be just the um, the second stint of a one-stop race by, by a lap. Um, just sort of computer, computer said, do this. Uh, but they were completely taken aback by just how powerful the undercut was, um, especially how stunningly quick Max's outlap was. And, uh, yeah, so Max undercut himself back into the lead. And that looked to be that. I mean, Lewis was with him and able to put pressure on, but wasn't significantly faster or slower and, and was behind the car behind. So that just did look to be that in the early stages because it, looked, was, it was going to be a one-stop race. But then we started hearing drivers saying, don't think these tyres are going to make, especially especially Max actually, saying we're not going to not going to get the end on these tyres. And that, of course, was relayed to Lewis, who said, I agree with it. Um, let's make sure we undercut them. But you can see why Lewis was thinking that, and maybe it would have worked, but maybe not, because Sergio Perez um, was, was there. So you couldn't necessarily do the repeat of Barcelona or Hungary last year, where there was such a gap to drop into that you could make the, the stop and make the loss back up because you're going to have to get past Perez first, who was uh, doing a super long stint um, because he you know, decided he was going to really, really look, at, look after the tyres and make, make, it, make sure it was a one-stop. So it might not have worked, that, but it's, um, it, on the other hand, it may have done. But anyway, it was taken out of their hands because this, on this occasion, Red Bull felt confident enough to surrender the lead and come in and commit to a two-stop. And so that was that. That obliged um, Mercedes to leave Hamilton out there. And basically the, the tables were turned and Max was able to do to Hamilton what Hamilton had done to Max in Barcelona and Hungary last year. And led to that excellent penultimate lap pass at the, the chicane, which is a very dramatic denouement to the race. But we should point out that that, that Verstappen middle stint, it was very short, 14 laps. And although you can criticise Mercedes for not taking an undercut there, it was very early, as you say, Mark, which I think is worth remembering just how short that that stint was. Scott, there's obviously been a lot of talk about the strategies that were deployed. On this podcast, and we're going to do this on every Grand Prix review podcast, we invite members of the Races Members Club to email in questions. You get an email on race day, and there's a certain window in which you can send in questions about the race. So the first one comes from Tamara Salter who asked about the Mercedes strategy and asked why the Mercedes strategy in general hasn't been good enough this season when previously it's been a strong point and what can it do to improve? And I guess we should specifically focus on this race. Was Mercedes strategy a genuine problem or was it just one of those things today? Um, well, they, ultimately, they've, they've, they haven't done a good enough job um, in, in in this instance. For for whatever reason, they did underestimate the um, the gap that you would need to survive the undercut. Andrew Shovelin said on Sunday evening that actually they they weren't entirely sure why why they'd misjudged it the way that they did um and ultimately they uh they, there's an element of uh, misjudging it with switching to the to the two stop uh as well i can see why on i can see the arguments why for for, for both cars actually um you don't want to you didn't want to drop either car behind Sergio Perez on track because he would have had relatively fresh tyres um, because he'd extended his first stint. So it would have been an obstacle to overcome. Obviously, Verstappen didn't have to overcome dropping behind Perez because Red Bull just moved him aside. So I I think that on this occasion, um, Mercedes did get it slightly wrong. I don't think it was necessarily a howler, uh, but sort of picking up on the wider, uh, the, the wider scope of tomorrow's question, um, I think we've seen plenty of examples over the years of Mercedes dropping the ball on strategy. Um, it tends to be quite spectacular when it happens. Like they don't, as an as an organization, they don't make many mistakes really. 
and they don't have many off weekends but when they have an off weekend my god do they have an off weekend like it tends to be either just serene and generally very brilliant or absolutely catastrophic and and sometimes there are some strategic howlers at, at the heart of that and i guess one argument would be that over the over the years if it hasn't been good enough they haven't really been punished because they haven't had uh they haven't had the sort of fight that they've got from red bull this this season um there are other times of course where mercedes has been very brave and and absolutely nailed the strategy. We've seen that a couple of times this year. Um, but I think this was one occasion where they did ask a little bit too much of Hamilton to save the day. And um, while the mantra is the, you know, that they lose as a, a win as a team and lose as a team, sometimes it's not quite 50 50, is it? And I think this was more on, this was much more on the Mercedes side than it was Hamilton's side for not winning this race. I think if you look at the wider picture this season, Bahrain, Mercedes strategy was on the money. And say the same in Spain as well. So it's a little bit swings and roundabouts. And you do tend to get that when it's so close. Because before it's generally been catastrophic strategic errors that have, have backfired. But now it's small marginal calls either way that, that can make all the difference. So yeah, very, very uh, tense. Mark, there's a question from Richard Craig who asks why Mercedes would ignore the views of their two drivers who plainly made it clear on team radio that a two-stopper was the best strategy. Well, I think they... With in the case of Lewis, um, who was saying, "Yeah, let's let's undercut them," um, I think they were on the same page at that point. But a little bit, as I talked about before, they were a little bit concerned whether it would work or not, given that Perez was going to be in the way. Um, and you got to remember that they have the, the the global picture more than the driver. Uh, as for Valt- Valtteri, uh, again. Valtteri's race was probably compromised by them using the second place car, in this case Valtteri, to boost the chances of, of a victory for the team. And that's why they brought him in when when they did. And then, of course, if he'd if they'd committed to a, an early two-stop for Valtteri, and it would have undercut him past Lewis in, in hindsight. Uh, so they, they wouldn't want to risk that either. It's, it wasn't a straightforward decision. It's, um, it's not just the driver says this, so let's do this, because the driver hasn't got the full picture. He's, he's just he got the picture from inside his car, and that's it. Um, yeah, in hindsight, uh, they didn't get it right, but I don't think you can say the drivers in giving that view had an informed view. It was just what they fancied doing, but... It, as I say, they, they, when they give their opinions, they're giving their opinions from that perspective. And, and they know that they haven't got the full picture and they know that there might be complicating factors that are um, neither wise to talk about over the radio because it gives the game away or, or, or just too involved. So, um, I, yeah, I don't think you, you should necessarily be guided just by what the driver wants to do if you're trying to win the team a race. And I think there's certain drivers who... If you listen to them on strategy, you'd be making 17 stop races or something, or or you get to about five pit stops and they come in again, you'd say, you haven't got any tyres left. So uh, yeah, the, the drivers have, a, as you say, a very, very narrow view of things. But it was interesting with the, the Perez-Bottas battle, because this was kind of a an echo of the battle up front, because Bottas was ahead in third place. Perez actually dropped back in that first stint, wasn't looking particularly strong, but he made the one stopper work and past Bottas uh, later on. Scott, you did do a piece on the race website, the race.com. don't forget the hyphen if you want to have a look at that, about Nico Rosberg's criticism of Bottas's defending uh, late on against Verstappen because obviously he had a part to play in delaying Max. Do you think that criticism was fair? Um, eh, not really. Um, I understood what sort of the wider point that Nico was making. Um, he, he described Bottas's defence as rubbish and he described... Hamilton's defence of Verstappen is a bit soft. I think a bit soft could probably uh, apply to Rosberg's argument as well, to be honest. It, it was just, it was the sort of thing that I thought made, it was good TV. It was why he's there as a pundit. I don't really think it was um, anything more than that. It's a slightly lazy argument because he claimed that there were smarter ways for Bottas to defend. Didn't offer any of them up. <laughs> um, I, I think that... Both both Mercedes drivers were sitting ducks. Bottas, the the mistake Bottas made in his defence was, I think, committing to the defensive line the way he did, because I think Max was catching him a bit too late in the straight to do anything. 
but it was wise to cover it off. But maybe he didn't need to do it as much as he did. And then when he got there, he he clearly just braked way too late. Like he did well to keep it on the road, but he that that's what left him a sitting duck on the exit of the chicane. Um, but the counter argument is that it does, doesn't make a difference because a few laps later, when he was passed by Perez, Bottas did actually judge the defence into the chicane perfectly. He even made Perez check up on the exit, but such was the extra grip that Perez had and also the straight line speed of the Red Bull and I guess he, he, he might have had a bit more battery to deploy as well. Perez still nailed him on the out, on, on the run to, to the next corner and that was with a perfect defence through the chicane. So yes, Bottas needs to put the, his best foot forward all the time and do absolutely everything in his power to keep Max behind. Did he do that? Probably not. Did it make a difference? No. <laughs> so to call it rubbish, I just thought it was a I just thought it was a bit of Nico Rosberg excited punditry. Um, and that, while I'm on the subject, just as he, you know, he was criticizing Hamilton for it as well. Um, you know, said, why didn't he close the door to be honest? And I said this, I wrote this in my piece. I'm much more inclined to trust Hamilton in the art of wheel to wheel battling and defending and that sort of thing than I am Rosberg considering Rosberg was uh, on the receiving end of some lessons from Hamilton in their time as teammates. Yeah, I think Nico is just enjoying being able to dish out the criticism on that. I had a few disagreements with him about how good he was in wheel to wheel battle. Excellent driver, Nico Rosberg, but I wouldn't necessarily say wheel to wheel combat was his uh, number one on the strengths list, let's put it that way. There is a lot of interest in Valtteri Bottas' situation in general. The first question about him from our members I can tick off. Sean Charleston asks why Mercedes didn't pit Bottas after he was passed by Perez so he could take the free pit stop for fastest lap because, of course, he wouldn't have lost fourth place because he had plenty of free air. Now, the reason for that was simply that there was a track limits investigation to Perez's pass, so there was a possibility of a five-second penalty. Ultimately, though, Bottas couldn't stay within five seconds anyway, and the penalty wasn't given. So, yes, it would have been better to take the stop on the fastest lap point. That would have been a two-point swing back towards Mercedes. But because there was the possibility that third could return to them, they they left him out. The next couple of questions, slightly wider, Scott. Simon Townsend asks if this is the beginning of the end of Bottas's time at Mercedes, citing him not letting Hamilton pass as quickly as he should have done in the Spanish Grand Prix and his complaints not being listened to in the French Grand Prix. And Aldis Putnins points out that Bottas didn't put up much of a fight against Verstappen, so is this him focusing on his own agenda? And perhaps does this give Red Bull an advantage if Bottas is half-hearted this season? Um, well, picking up on the last point, I don't think um, I don't think Bottas is phoning it in. Um, I think it was a little bit like you could argue it's a little bit like the Spanish Grand Prix. Do you remember when um, Bottas didn't necessarily make it as easy as he could have uh, getting out of the way for Hamilton when they crossed paths on different strategies during the race? <laughs> Bottas does have his own race to look after. He's trying to limit his own time loss as much as possible because he's still fighting for a podium in that situation. Um, and he was trying to defend, you know, he, he he didn't, it was not in his interest to outbreak himself the way he did into the chicane defending from Verstappen. It was just a misjudgment. It wasn't because he wasn't um, trying or or, or or anything like that. Um, the first part of it, I mean, you could argue, you could probably pick any point from the start of this season as the beginning of the end of Bottas' time at Mercedes. The, the, the crash with George Russell at Imola is probably going to be everyone's favourite if Bottas does lose his drive then people will be going back and say that was the moment because he crashed because he was racing with the guy who's racing in a driving a bat marker team but i think i i i don't think that this has been necessarily a breakdown in the bottas uh mercedes relationship you know simon picks up what i pointed out there about the spanish grand prix and there was yeah there was the case in this race of Valtteri getting angry over the radio because um, he said he insisted that he'd flagged the validity of the two-stop strategy or pre- preference for a two-stop strategy and he wasn't listened to so I understand that why he's frustrated but that's just heat of the moment stuff I don't think there's anything out of the ordinary in what Bottas did and I don't think Bottas regrets what he said and I think you heard from Toto Wolf and Toto certainly didn't seem to care that Bottas was getting a bit feisty yeah he was absolutely uh, talking it up he said he, he loves it he loves that uh, he speaks his mind now and doesn't internalise, was how Toto Wolf, uh, Wolf put it. I, I did ask Toto if he was a bit concerned that this Bottas weakness that we've talked about before in terms of tyre management it, it is a concern. And he says that although there's still a gap to Hamilton, he still feels Valtteri is chipping away in that. So 
improving. So he was defending his driver, should we say. So there wasn't much sign of him having a, a, a massive fallout. Now, Mark, inevitably, we have a couple of questions about the impact of Pirelli raising the tyre pressures, as well as that 18-page technical directive that governs how the teams have to treat the tyres and the various ways they are checked. We won't ask you to talk through all 18 pages of that because I'm not sure that would make uh, very good podcast material. But Ed Steiger asks if the French Grand Prix and Mercedes struggles late in stints is evidence the pressure changes have hurt Mercedes more than Red Bull. While Janus van der Waal asks which of the two teams benefited from the technical directive. I don't think we really found out because I don't think the driving mechanism of the tyre difficulties today was um, was the rear tyres really. It was the fronts. And it was the rear tyres that were um, really highly pressurised after the events of Baku. So I think uh, today it was more driven by the, uh, the the track surface and the, the rain beforehand. And just generally uh, that was uh, a, a graining um, phenomenon that, uh, that, that caught most of them out. I think everybody was expecting some graining on the medium, but it was much worse than people uh, were expecting. And pre-race, I don't think anyone was expecting any graining on the hard, but even the hard grained. Um, so I can, you know, the, the, the two stop came onto the radar. So actually, I don't, I don't think we've actually seen um, what the impact is and how it affects each of the the top two teams um, of, of those uh, the, the 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 new stipulations post Baku. I don't think we've seen it yet. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think. As you say, an unusual sort of race. We don't have so many of the races where it's the front axle and front graining that's that's the problem. So you know, have to reserve judgment on that and see what happens in the Red Bull ring for the upcoming double header. But ultimately, interesting to see a battle between both pairs of Mercedes and Red Bull drivers, should we say, with Verstappen beating Hamilton and Perez beating Bottas. Let's look outside the big two teams now. Scott, a successful day for McLaren with Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo taking a 1-2 in the midfield fight in 5th and 6th places, up from 8th and 10th on the grid. We've got another member question here. Peter C asks if Norris's strategy of running long before his stop on lap 24 was a stroke of luck or a stroke of genius, as it seemed to be by leaving him out for so long he was left in no man's land, but he pulled off a series of of great moves. Yeah, he did. Um, the the sort of making of McLaren's race was was really early on when they started to win back a bit of uh, track position, and it was just it was just clear that they had uh, superior tire management to their immediate rivals in the midfield, and I, I, and that's what I think set up Norris's strategy because we saw Perez um, Perez ran along as well because he was able to ultimately your ability to the un- the reason you don't run long is because you're either uh, susceptible to an undercut and you're worried that track position is going to be absolutely king or you simply do not have the tyres and the pace to continue. So the way McLaren and uh, the way McLaren looked at it, it was simp- it was clear that um Norris looked like he was able to um maintain a good enough pace for a longer period of time and he was able to take that trade off of losing a bit of track position late on because he'd built up enough of a tyre offset to be able to um be confident he'd be take that, take those places back and the end result ultimately ultimately um validates that um so yeah i don't think it was um sort of a stroke of luck really i think it was the conclusion of a series of things going in mclaren's favor early on and i think it was also them sort of weighing things up live as it happened and deciding what would work and what didn't and they sort of went slightly different didn't they between the across the two drivers and the net result was fifth and sixth so you have to say that they judged each of those drivers respective situations absolutely perfectly yeah, Norris was 12 seconds up the road from the rest of the midfield front runners. So it really, really worked for him. Daniel Ricciardo, I thought, had his probably his most convincing race for McLaren. I particularly liked his first corner move. He said that the previous time at Paul Ricciardo, he got stuck in the middle at the start and lost places, but he just barreled around the outside of uh, a load of people at the start. So that was encouraging. Good to see Mark Ricciardo seems to be working reasonably well, a nice late-breaking move on Fernando Alonso during the race as well. So he's he's getting back to normal service that we expect from him. It's getting closer. It's still not uh, the Daniel Ricciardo used to be or um, hopefully will be in the future. But uh, yes, it's, it, was a, it was a competitive showing, let's say. Um, he's still outshaded by his teammate. And 
you know, you know how intensely competitive he is. We know how hacked off he'll be about that. But yeah, it was it was a reasonable performance. Yeah, definitely Norris was the the quicker still, but Ricardo hoping this triple header will really work for him with lots of time in the car. Now, we have to talk about McLaren's closest rival in the battle for third in the Constructors' Championship, which is Ferrari. They came away with zero points, despite Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc starting fifth and seventh. So what went wrong there, Mark? The the tyres just fell to pieces. They, they were uh, absolutely nowhere with their tyre management, and they were hoping that the... Um, what Carlos Sainz was saying, more in hope than expectation, I think, that the if the um, if other teams had been doing things around the, the pressures that they weren't supposed to be, the, the new protocols would um, maybe help help Ferrari in that the, they tend to qualify better than the race, um, which would be consistent with, you know, his, his theory um, would be consistent with it, with, with that trait. But it, it, no, I, th- I think this is a. I think it's unconnected to the uh, protocols of uh, that have been established in the tech directive as a result of Baku, and b. I don't think that um, I don't think his his theory is going to hold up anyway. So all that happened was uh, Ferrari was very much uh, caught out um, by the the same limitation that everybody else had, but to a, a greater extent. And it was just, the, the, the graining was awful. And Sainz dealt with it better than Leclerc. Leclerc tends to um, sort of monster the car a little bit when he can't get it to do what he wants. And Sainz sort of just very precisely gives it the inputs that balances the tyre and the car on, on, on the edge. And in those situations, it's sort of important about qualifying as well. In those sort of situations, he, he tends to do a little bit better. And so Charles, yeah, you ended up nowhere uh, on a on a two stop. He surrendered on the on the one stop very early, and then got stuck behind an alpha, and that was that really. Um, and just yeah, so there were there were nowhere. Yeah, sixteenth for Charles Leclerc in the end makes Carlos Sainz's eleventh place look uh, positively successful. But I think we should be careful about drawing too many conclusions about Ferrari's performance level given the unusual tyre circumstances in that race. But we do have a question, Scott, from Jay Kaufman 328 who asks if Ferrari should focus on the battle with Aston Martin and Alfa Tauri for fourth rather than swinging above their weight with McLaren. And he also suggests that Sainz and Leclerc are outperforming the car in qualifying. Um, no, I don't, I don't think that's the case because I think Ferrari need to be trying to do the best job they can. They're, they're still trying to rebuild from last year. There are some still some shortcomings on the team side as well. I, I know you... Late last year, they were admitting that they weren't doing a good enough job, a good enough job with pit stops, for example. So, I think ultimately Ferrari needs to aim for whatever's possible. I think they've got the third fastest car over one lap. I don't think they've got the third fastest car in race trim. Uh, don't, I, I just think it's a bit too temperamental, um, and I think there are certain con- certain conditions where the deficit that they have to McLaren on a Sunday is greater than the advantage that they can get in qualifying. So they might only qualify one or two places in front of the McLaren. But then race time, they'll, they might be 10, 15 seconds slower over the course of the race, which is obviously worse. Um, we've seen a few times when Ferrari can, I don't know whether they're making themselves immune to their limitations or the circuit and uh, weather conditions combine to make sure that Ferrari's protected from its limitations. But when that car's in, in the right window, it's it, it can clearly beat the McLaren on a Sunday. So all the while that's possible. They should be aiming for it. What they can't do and what they're not doing is focus development on this year to try and beat McLaren. They've, they're not doing that anymore. They uh, they switched development to 2022 a long time ago. So the car is fundamentally staying the same, but their understanding of it can continue to improve. And it needs to because that is ultimately how you improve as a race team um, and as a technical department as well because just because you're not bringing upgrades, upgrades doesn't mean you can't improve the car. So... I think they should aim as high as possible. Um, and as for Sainz and Leclerc outperforming the car and qualifying, I sort of touched on it there. I just think the car is better relative to its immediate opposition. I think that car is, I think that car is better on a Saturday than it is a Sunday. So Sainz and especially Leclerc, because we know that he's just ridiculously good in qualifying, tend to star on Saturdays, and then Sundays a little bit hard work for them. Well, and we should say to back that up, the lead Ferrari has always been ahead of the lead McLaren in qualifying so far this year in all seven race weekends. So I think your assessment is spot on there. Although 7-0 in qualifying and what is it, 4-3 to McLaren now? 
in the races for the lead car. Yeah, so that, that tells you all you need to know, doesn't it? I think this this battle will run and run, but I think Ferrari will be ruining the fact they left quite a few points on the table in Baku and Monaco because you can't afford to do that. McLaren are probably leaving fewer points on the table in that regard, I would say, despite the fact Daniel Ricciardo still taking time to get back to his absolute best. But Mark, Pierre Gasly was again the interloper in the battle at the front of the midfield, qualified sixth and finished seventh. Franz Tost was talking him up as one of the best in F1. Another good result on the the CV, and it's just it's just Gasly doing what Gasly does these days, isn't it? Yeah, Gasly's a very solid, um, quick, feisty driver, and the Alpha Tauri is a very nicely mannered car. Really, it's uh, if you can get it in into its in its window, it's it's you know you can race a McLaren with it, sort of thing. Um, not always, but that's. And it's that's about where it, it it deserves to be, and and he can unerringly put it there and just deliver throughout the weekend. He's a very um, very good barometer of, of where the car's at. Uh, I don't think I, I still haven't seen signs that he's uh, a Leclerc level or Verstappen level megastar, but I think he's he's very very good. He's um, totally deserves his place in a a quick car. Yeah, he's become utterly dependable, really, ever since he was busted back down to what was then called Toro Rosso. He's been basically a driver you expect to see in the points, and it's rare when he when he isn't. So, yeah, very good for Pierre Gasly and good on home soil that he was able to give the, the trickler waving fans something to cheer about. Well, Scott, towards the bottom of the points, Alpine had a mixed bag of a day in its home Grand Prix. Fernando Alonso 8th, but Esteban Ocon down in 14th place. Does that feel like the promised return to form for Alpine? Um, well, if it is, <laughs> they've got some concerns, haven't they? Um, this was all about this weekend, the first step in the ret- attempt to return to respectability and you know achieve their goal of finishing at least 5th in the Constructors' Championship. Um Really, this race just reiterated that while they while the car seems to be sort of seems to have a window where it looks pretty competitive over one lap, it's just got some flaws in race trim. It just seems to come unstuck a little bit. But you've sort of looked into that a little bit more. I know, haven't you, Ed? And and also sort of looked a little bit more into um the Alonso situation because quite clearly he um got more out of it on, on Sunday, but could could that have been a little bit different had he not sort of convinced them to flip a team order? I think he was probably about right on that one. It, it all happened because they were on split strategies. So Alonso was on the standard strategy, which most of the field did, which was a one-stopper, medium onto hards. Ocon was on the reverse because he had a free choice of tyres, having started outside the top 10 in 11th place. So that they knew before the race that there was a chance they could cross paths in that Stint. So, yeah, they did ask Alonso to let Ocon pass. And he was also told to be very careful not to let Stroll through because Stroll was behind Ocon and, and haranguing him there. And Alonso initially didn't do it and then said, I'm not sure this is a very good idea because how he Esteban wasn't quite close enough. I'm going to lose time. He, in the end, he said, I'll do it at turn one next lap if you want me to, but I think it's better to stop. Pull me out of the way, give give Ocon clear air to avoid losing time. And they did kind of agree to that. So they rescinded the the team order. It, it's not some huge controversy. It wasn't Alonso stamping his feet or anything. He showed willingness, but it's just an interesting little detail. He's got a very good command of what's going on in the race in general, Alonso. And I think he was he was correct there. So I don't think it really made much difference to either of their races. Alpine struggled with the the medium certainly Alonso in the first stint terrible terrible graining so he started reasonably well was running eighth and he'd slipped down to 11th by the time he was being bothered by Ocon just as the the fronts were were going away but then once on the hards the race pace was actually pretty good and and he was going forward he reckoned he could have got Gasly had Gasly not been sat in the DRS toe of Ricardo for a while so yeah Alonso reasonably happy about things Ocon just suffered because that reverse tyre strategy wasn't a particularly good one in the end. Not many of those who ran on it had a huge amount of benefit from it, and he ended up just stuck behind George Russell at, uh, at the end of the race, so they did uh, catch up with him. So I think for Alpine, solid. You know, They're not at Ferrari-McLaren level on pace, although they were obviously better than Ferrari in the in the race, and they're still not really at consistently at AlphaTauri level, but a little bit more convincing than on the 
on the street circuits, which is encouraging. But Mark, final two points places went to Aston Martin, Sebastian Vettel and Lance Stroll. They were the only ones who really made that reverse strategy work re- reasonably well. They started on the hards, then went to the mediums. Is this just where Aston Martin is on a normal track after the, the highs of Monaco and Baku? I think so, yes. And I mean, the, strategically, they tried to do um, what they'd done at um, Monaco and Baku by just running along. And that was, you know, the, the, they were hoping to do some um, some overcutting there. But that that's what uh, determined their, their, their choice of um, starting on the hards because they were both outside the top 10. And it, that, it, 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 that part of the grid where they are, the sort of um, upper end of Q2, I, I think on this occasion it, it, it would have made very little difference. I think you would have got a very similar end result had you done the standard medium hard than what they did. But it was, it, it was worth a try. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't think that uh, there was probably any, in terms of results, I don't think there's anything left on the table there. I think that's about where they should be given the performance of their car. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's probably fair. Decent drive from both. Stroll obviously had a disaster in Q1 because he had his first lap time deleted and uh, never actually got another chance to properly set a lap time because of those red flags. And Vettel, yeah, had a decent drive. He did have one off at Bose when he uh, got caught out by Augusta Wind, which cost him three, three and a half seconds in that first stint. But other than that, a nice tidy race. Scott, George Russell, he was very pleased with himself. Finished 12th, so ahead of people like Yuki Tsunoda, Ocon, even Leclerc justified for him to be happy or just another pointless race for him no this was a good uh this was a good performance from george um is one of those where he comes out of it thinking that he's got everything out of the car and it's um it doesn't always happen but it's also one where he felt that the car was genuinely competitive in the midfield as well so it was quite an impressive turnaround as well from where he found himself after the start i noticed that he was um running by running behind latifi for a while because he sort of got pinched into turn one by Latifi and Nikita Mazepin and then he lost a place to Kimi Raikkonen as well um, and he just had one of those stints we've seen it a few times um, sort of a few times it was mainly actually when Robert Kubitz was his teammate in 2019 um, sort of spend a few laps stuck behind your slower teammate then he eventually got past Latifi gaps in pretty much immediately um, and but it was the second stint that was the most impressive because you know he was um he had to overtake Yuki Tsunoda's Alpatauri on track he caught um sorry he, he kept the alpine of Ocon behind him on merit um and he finished within 10 seconds of Sainz's Ferrari so um you know the Latifi was w- w- was well back by comparison so the Williams was genuinely decent in race trim in that midfield group here seemed to do a pretty decent job of its tires but this was another one of those races where Russell absolutely extracted everything out of it and yet another one of those races where if this was the sort of Grand Prix where there was a bit of attrition or something, then he would be benefiting from it. But yeah, the pointless streak at Williams continues, but you can't can't use that as uh, any evidence that he's not doing a very good job in what is not a very good car. Yeah, he's maybe a little bit unfortunate. This is one of those races where not a single car retired. I think the status is the 10th time that's happened in World Championship History, obviously, it does happen occasionally these days with high reliability rates, but uh, was pretty rare that that happened uh, in, in the past. But Mark mentioned Sonoda there. He was in the wall in qualifying on his first Q1 lap. Rookie over exuberance, or do you think he's starting to test Red Bull and Alpha Tauri's patience? I think they're still keeping a faith in them, but um, that was just totally a rookie error, yes. Um, you're in an Alpha Tauri, you, you, you're going to if you just do the lap that you know that you don't need to be putting it absolutely on the limit at every corner just to get through q1 you you just need to do a a par lap and you will get through to q2 and you can then start thinking about how hard to push it and that, that's just basic stuff and we've we saw him do the same thing at imola so you know um yeah <laughs> he's um his army like regime in Italy with uh, Franz Tost doesn't seem to have um, had much of an impact on his uh, um, his, his behavioural pattern in the car. But, uh, he, you know, he does have a lot of potential. You do see glimpses of it. Um, but he, we've yet to see the um, dazzling performer that we saw in Bahrain. Yeah, I I rate Sonoda and I, and I hope he does well. The trajectory's on's a little bit worrying because I can see it leading to a 
to a bad end if it keeps going like this. So each of the last three races, he's had a an interface with a wall at some point in the the weekend. Admittedly, two of them were street circuits, so he's got to show that he can balance up attacking with keeping his pace and not not hitting the wall. He seems to have given away a little bit of pace without gaining the uh, the connected safety margin, which is a little bit worrying, but. We knew he was promoted into Formula One quite uh, quite early. He'd had one season in F three, one season in F two, and yeah, hopefully he will uh, he will build on on this experience. Uh, now, those we haven't mentioned: Alfa Romeo pairing Antonio Giovinazzi, Kimi Raikkonen, fifteenth and seventeenth. Both did that reverse strategy, starting on hards. They were never quite in the points fight, which is often the case. And of course, as we said, all twenty starters finished. Nicholas Latifi, eighteenth out of the two Haas drivers. They had a bit of a incident early on when they were battling but uh, finished 14 seconds apart with Mick Schumacher ahead of Mazepin. Schumacher got into Q2. Well he technically got into Q2. He got on the timing sheets, uh, got his name on it as it were but he had that crash at the end of Q1 which obviously brought qualifying to an end for for everyone and helped him get through but positive for, for Mick Schumacher despite that Mark. Yeah the, I mean the, 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 the pace is reasonable and he's a rookie so I think you've got to make allowances. I think um, he's consistently getting um, more out of the car than his teammate. Um, so that's that's all we can really judge it on. And he's he's sort of you know ticking the boxes otherwise. But yeah, there's there's the odd rookie error. We've we saw one in Monaco as well, didn't we? And um, and on the behind the safety car, Imola. But yeah, I don't think there's any any worrying trend there. It's not not like in the as you talked about in the case of Sonoda, where, where it's really you know it would, must be given the team some real concern. I, I don't think that's the case uh, with, with with Mick. I think um, it's just one of those things, and those blips will it'll, it'll just get ironed out with um, with more mileage. And we've got the Styrian Grand Prix up next, the first of a Red Bull Ring. Doubleheader, dare we make any predictions for what that might hold, particularly in terms of hopes of another close fight? What do you reckon, Mark? I, no, I think the the way the way it's poised at the moment with um, with the tyres as well, the, the, the variables are are all they're, they're hugely sensitive this this season. With the, the first of all, with the new spec tyres, and then of course with the the post Baku, uh, we yet to see the effect of the, the real effect of the post Baku tech directives and the, the higher pressures generally going to be about two psi higher at the rear um so that and how uh different uh layouts are affecting the the, the high rake and the low rake cars it's all it's all sort of thrown up even though the, the the changes were supposed to be relatively few the um they've had a big effect and it's 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 increasingly difficult to um to, to call how, uh, you know, going into a weekend, how it's going to be, even, even for the teams themselves. So, no, I, I don't, I really wouldn't like to call it. And that's exactly how we like it. We like it to be unpredictable. And it has been quite often so far this season. Just to finish off, we did have uh, a question from William Sproil about uh, about Mercedes, saying whether, asking whether Toto Wolff will rue his decision to transition development to 2022 prematurely, as he puts it, and also whether there could be some ripple effects on Mercedes if Red Bull has a runaway season uh, because Red Bull developed the car a little bit further before transitioning to 2022. There's some uh, questions about whether this could almost lead to the team unravelling with distrust of strategy and uh, so on and so forth and doubts arising. What do you make of that, Scott? Uh, I admire the creativity of thought. Uh, it's not necessarily something that I buy into because I think we've seen time and time again that actually this team comes back stronger from uh, for, from problems and I don't really see any evidence of it sort of falling apart from, from within and I don't necessarily think that you're going to trade Merck for, for Red Bull either. Um least of all because it's not like Red Bull can go on a massive recruitment strategy, right? Because we've got the budget cap, so everyone's having to sort of look after what they're doing. They've just been downsizing. They can't go around and start poaching other people as and when they choose. So, no, I, th- I think ultimately it's a very it's very difficult. Mercedes and Red Bull know that they both need to keep improving their cars, otherwise they're not gonna um, they're not gonna win the title this year. Uh, but improving the cars doesn't necessarily mean you know spending wind tunnel time or CFD time and actually bringing up updates. I don't know 
whether we have seen the last of little tweaks here and there to the W12 or, uh, or, or the RB16B. Um, but my suspicion is neither team wants to go any further than they have to um, because it, it's, it's too it's too big a trade in the short term versus the, 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 the long term. So I think they both made their decisions a long time ago now on what their development strategies would be. I think they have to stand by them. And I think it will be interesting to see how it plays out. And there are bound to be knock-on effects in in some ways. For example, if um, you know if Red Bull can go on a great run and over the next few races win a bunch of races, may, maybe maybe they'll be able to turn a, a fraction more attention on to twenty twenty two than they already have. But it's um, without knowing obviously their exact development schedules. It's all lifts and butts. But you know, I don't see I, Merck aren't at the standard they need to be at the moment. But I don't see it unraveling. And it's one of those things that because it's so close, both teams are going to have good and bad weekends, aren't they? We're seeing Mercedes tested in a way they have not been tested for a, for a long time. And often small cracks can look like much bigger cracks, should we say, when things get this tight. So, yeah, I think, uh, I guess the uh, it can have an unravelling effect, but I'd be surprised because Mercedes is a very, very formidable team. And so is Red Bull. And that's why hopefully we'll get to Abu Dhabi if that's where the season ends, which it's certainly due to. They should be pretty close and it'll all go down to the wire. Well, thanks for your time, Mark Hughes and Scott Mitchell. Head to the race.com and don't forget the hyphen as there'll be Mark's race analysis to read my ever controversial driver ratings while Scott is taking a look at where this win ranks among Verstappen's best and Ferrari's capitulation. Make sure you try out our other podcasts. We've got ones devoted to MotoGP, IndyCar and Formula E as well as Bring Back V10s which tells classic F1 stories. And also head to YouTube if video is your thing. And thanks also to our members, club members, who sent us some wonderful questions. If you remember, you'll get this email on race day, every race, with a chance to ask some race-specific questions that we will cover in our podcast, as we've done in this episode. To find out how you become a member, head to the race and click on Join the Race for all the information you need. Well, we're keeping our fingers crossed for another exciting race at the Red Bull Ring next weekend, and we'll be back next week with everything you need to know from the Styrian Grand Prix. (laughs) 